is Father Alan McDonald. I'm the pastor here at St. Joseph Church. And tonight is basically an orientation. We're really not going to get into any heavy uh, teachings of the church. Um, but it's a night for us to give you your textbooks and show you what the uh, various uh, Thursdays will entail. I do want to apologize for the air conditioning not working. We're on a timing system. And during the summer, our administrator put it on our summer schedule, which meant nothing going on in the evening, except he forgot to change it uh, for tonight uh, and this class. So next week we will have air conditioning, but do apologize for that. I'd like to start first with uh, a prayer, and then um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Jerry Schmidt, and he will do uh, a little bit, and then he'll turn it back over to me, and, and we should be finished in less than an hour, uh, from what I can tell. Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you call us to be your people, that you initiate a relationship with us, even when we do not know that your grace is being poured forth upon us. We thank you for the many times in which you have shown us your love, especially through the people that you have sent to us in our lives. We thank you for the scriptures and for your church and for the many ways in which we can learn to know, love, and serve you in this life and to be happy with you forever in the life to come. We ask you to bless uh, this class, our uh, members uh, who are assisting us in this process, those who are inquiring. Help us all to continue to learn about your love and the challenges that you offer us to live as your people in this world. And we make this prayer in the name of your son, Jesus who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Before I turn it over to, Mary, uh, to Mr. Jerry Smith, um, Schmidt, I want, uh, first of all, to let you all know what RCIA stands for. Uh, Catholic churches uh, use acronyms a, a great deal. And what it means is Roman Catholics in agony. <laughs> no. It means the rite, R I T E, like a, a ceremony, rite of Christian initiation of adults. Primarily, the rite of Christian initiation of adults is geared towards those who have never been baptized, those adults who have never been baptized. But we also recognize there are others who may have been brought up in a, a church affiliation. Uh, or are very church, uh, but they are not real familiar with everything that the Catholic Church teaches. And so uh, this rite of Christian initiation of adults also applies to those um, who are seeking full communion with the Catholic Church. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Jerry Schmidt, who is our coordinator for this program. He's going to uh, let our RCIA team introduce themselves and then... Uh, I'll come back and share a little bit about my own faith journey and Jerry with his and Father Justin Ferguson, our associate pastor or parochial vicar, will do as well. So I'll turn it over to Jerry. Welcome. I am so excited. <laughs> this is absolutely awesome. Absolutely awesome. It's, yeah, I think it really dawned on me today uh, when I realized uh, I looked at my sheet and I thought, the Lord's really been at work. And to imagine that he has called each of us to this place, in this town, in this state, in this country, in this century. Because there's been 20 centuries before us when Jesus walked here on this earth. you know, And for him to choose us at this particular time in our journey together. And he placed in each of us together to, to share him. It just blew me away. I'd like to go all the way back to... You know, Adam and Eve, but uh, uh, Jesus is far, far now. <laughs> but anyhow, we're uh, very happy to have you. And uh, uh, if there's any questions or anything you have, uh, you have uh, assistance at your table as well as uh, uh, Father. Also, uh, we have Buck Milton sitting here in back. Uh, introduce him right away. Here is one of our cate catechists. And uh, there's also uh, Carol. Springer Sergeant, okay. She is uh, the coordinator of the sponsors, okay. And uh, come November, uh, she will be talking, actually before then, she'll be talking with each of you. And besides having a group minister with you, you'll also have a sponsor you can ask questions about. So we want you to meet as many people in the parish, you know, as you can and get you, get you exposed and, and well indoctrinated. <laughs> but anyhow. Uh, 
Here's the textbook that you'll be using is Catholicism for Dummies. Now, we're not trying to insult you on the first night that you're here, but uh, uh, we've used a different textbook in the past, but this one seems to speak more to people that are searching and, and really have a lot of questions about our practices, our prayers, and uh, our history. So you'll find this very helpful. But it means that this year I have to pre prepare all new classes because I've used the same textbook uh, up until this past year for the last 30 years, so I had it memorized. So uh, this year is going to be a little bit uh, uh, different for me, but we hope it will be just as good for you. The format of the teaching will be, um, we'll gather at 7, try to begin as, at close to 7 as possible. We'll have a presentation, usually mine go for 45 minutes to an hour. And then uh, you'll have some questions at your table, and your table leader will lead you in a discussion of those questions based on, the, t on the, uh, the chapter that we've studied. Now, I know some people are reticent about sharing in discussion, so don't feel like you're pressured to do that because we don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable, so you can just sit there and listen if you wish. So we're not trying to put anybody on the spot. Uh, but we do find the, the discussion after the class uh, at the table to be very helpful to help people to process what we've learned. Again, this process is not meant to uh, force you to do anything. Uh, some people go through this whole class and decide not to become Catholic, and that is their prerogative. In fact, we have two or three uh, that go on for years and years. I see them at Mass every Sunday. They've been through this whole thing, and they still haven't become Catholic. Um, but anyway, that's your option. That's your prerogative. Uh, we're not going to try to talk you into becoming a Catholic. We want the Holy Spirit to lead you. And if he's not leading you here, we hope that uh, you will find uh, a place where the Lord is uh, leading you. But give it a, a chance. Uh, and if you have questions, ask them. There is no question um, that is too stupid. Only answers that Buck has that are too stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and also on our bulletin, uh, Father Justin and I have our email, uh, and if you ever just want to email us because you're having a hard time with some aspect of the Catholic faith and want some clarification, or you want to express how you feel about something, sometimes email is a good way to, to dialogue. So if you'd like to do that with uh, anybody, actually, um, please feel free. The other thing that um, struck me tonight is how many Catholics we have assisting in this process. Up until about uh, maybe 20, 25 years ago, uh, if you were starting the RCIA, it would be just you guys who were the inquirers and me, and that would be it. And then every week uh, I'd be teaching and uh, there'd be no discussion and you'd go home. Um, but we've developed a newer process so that you get to know other Catholics in the parish because the church really is the baptized people of God who have a common belief based upon scripture and tradition and try to live in a, a particular way and pray in a particular way, but there are many different spiritualities in the Catholic Church, not just one type of spirituality, and you'll learn more about that as time goes on. So I'm grateful for our RCIA team because it gives you a sense of the parish that you're joining. Um, I always find it fascinating, the first night that we meet with a group like this, uh, some of you probably are wondering, I don't know if I want to be here, or what's going to happen, and how weird are Catholics, and are they going to brainwash me, and is this a cult? <laughs> and, <laughs> and then by the end of this, when people are received into the church at Easter time, it's, it's like this transformation has taken place, and really is by the grace of God. So I would just ask you to be open to the grace of God. We're not going to brainwash you, we're not going to... Uh, pull you into a cult. Uh, we want this to be something that uh, you want to do. I want to just share a little bit about uh, my own journey as a Catholic. You probably have heard the term from others in the room tonight that they are cradle Catholics, which means that we were born into a Catholic family, and as infants, our parents had us baptized. And then they made sure that uh, when we got into the second grade, we made our first confession and then our first communion, and then later we were uh, celebrating the sacrament of confirmation. And they taught us that we had to be married in the church in order to uh, have the sacrament of marriage or matrimony. And they would encourage some of us to become priests or become a sister or a brother. We'll talk more about that later on. So that's how I became Catholic. I was born into a Catholic family, and through baptism, even as an infant, I was 
born again, if you will, into the family of God, his adopted family, which is the church, uh, which is headed by the pope, our bishops, priests, and, and everyone else uh, who are members of the church. And so for me, the Catholic Church is a community that has a, a, a body of teachings that help to guide people's lives. But one of the things that I really love about the fact that I was born into a Catholic family and baptized as a baby, even though I had no uh, choice in it, I, didn't, I can't remember the baptism. If my parents took any pictures of it, they certainly had lost them over the years because I've never <laughs> seen a picture of me uh, being baptized. Uh, and I didn't understand what was happening. But that tells us something significant about God, that he chooses us or accepts us before we even have the ability to accept him. Uh, Cerise was saying that she grew up in the Philippines, which is predominantly Catholic, and didn't know any Protestants until she came to the United States. And uh, most of us who are Catholic have very good Baptist uh, friends, and sometimes our Baptist friends will ask us, well, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? And if you say, no, then they'll say, well, you're not saved. Um, or they'll ask you, when did you do it? And Catholics have a hard time saying when we did it because there's a, a series of things that occur in our lives. But what I always tell Catholics to, to uh, say to those who ask them that question is, say to them that God has accepted me, okay? And that him accepting me uh, is what begins salvation, not my accepting him, as though it's my work. Uh, now, it is important for us to respond and, and to participate in the grace that God gives us, but uh, I'm saying because Jesus Christ has accepted me and died for me on the cross, and I'm in the process of responding to his invitation to be a part of his life and to, to be a part of his church. And that is a lifelong process. And so, for me, being a Catholic... Uh, uh, starts with my family, my parents handing the faith on to me. But as I grew older and became a teenager, I questioned things like every other teenager does. And as you become a young adult going to college, even more questions arise. And, and you can see out in the world that there are a variety of belief systems and philosophies and, and even atheism. And I think all of us go through a struggle of, well, what does life mean? And then you have the temptations of life that pull you away from God and the church. And, Sometimes you go in an opposite direction altogether and you realize that your life is really not a life of salvation, but a life of damnation. And you can look at your life and see, gosh, I'm involved in drugs and alcohol and sex and uh, stealing and uh, treating people poorly and my life is not of God. And somehow that then, uh, God's grace still continues to be poured upon you and, and, and you learn more about his love and, and changes, conversions take place. And, and you rediscover your roots and who you are and, and who you should be. And I hope that that's uh, the case for all of you as well. We're not going to try to say anything bad about your religious upbringing, no matter how strong it was or, or, or how weak it was or if there was nothing there. Because as Catholics, we believe that God's grace is active in our lives, period. Uh, and even if you don't know it or didn't know it, if you were brought up a Baptist or a Methodist, God's grace was active there, teaching you uh, who he is and who you should be. Uh, if you become a Catholic, you're just going to build upon that. We're not going to wipe out anything. Um, for those of you who maybe have no faith, I want you to look over your life and see where God's love has been shown to you, even though you may not have known it. Where you might have experienced uh, forgiveness and healing, even though you didn't really attribute it to God. Or where you really felt like... Uh, there was something greater uh, than what you could see. And I think that that will also indicate to you that uh, the Spirit of God is with you and has been assisting you all along. So we're, we're not, by any stretch of imagination, going to help you to find God for the first time in your life in this process. I think God has found you long before you made your way here. And that's what's really important. The other thing, and I'll conclude and turn it over to Father Justin, and he's going to share a little bit. One of the things, one of the reasons why I remain Catholic is that the Catholic Church has a 2,000 year history and was founded by Jesus Christ. And that he named the apostles to be his closer, closest uh, followers, he named St. Peter be, to be the head of the apostles, and that continues through the succession of bishops in the Catholic Church. So you can trace the Catholic Church all the way back to Jesus Christ 
and Pope, John, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, you can trace back to uh, St. Peter, the Apostle. Uh, so the history of the Catholic Church and the fact that Jesus founded the Catholic Church is very important to me personally in terms of my own uh, acceptance of the Catholic faith. But the other thing is, uh, when you look at the history of the Catholic Church and study it, you know that if this was just a human endeavor, we would have disintegrated 1,000, 500, 600, 2,000 years ago, uh, because we really have flooded it along the way. Our members have, and we haven't always lived up to who we are meant to be, and our history is very colorful. But it tells us that the Holy Spirit has been there all along, and while civilizations and cultures have collapsed, the Catholic Church has continued. And even though people will say, well, this is the end of the road for the Catholic Church. They said it you know, in the 1600s. They said it in the uh, 4th century. They said it uh, um, in the 1800s. They're saying it today. Well, it's the end of the road for the Catholic Church. And before you know it, those who are saying that it's the end of the road for them, but the Catholic Church continues to go on. So this is all uh, an endeavor of God and His Holy Spirit. And we believe that the gates of hell will not prevail against the Church. Uh, try as uh, Satan and those of us who sin may uh, to erode the church. So that gives me a great deal of hope. But I think the most important part of being a Catholic is just knowing that God loves me, wants me to live forever in heaven, and he's placed a desire in me for some reason to want to go to heaven rather than to hell. And uh, so if you want to go to heaven and not go to hell, uh, the Catholic Church is a good place to discover how that occurs uh, by the grace of God and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So with that said, I'll turn it over to uh, Father Justin. Uh, as Father McDonald said, and, and also Jerry, I'm Father Justin Ferguson. I'm the uh, slave, I'm at parochial vicar <laughs> of the parish. Um, and what that means is parochial refers to the parish, uh, parochia, and vicar is I stand in the stead of the pastor when he can't be here, or whenever he tells me I have to be somewhere, I'm there. And uh, so it's a good, it's a good thing. Um, actually, Father McDonald told me that we were going with uh, Catholicism for dummies because he was tired of our team members coming to us and asking us the questions that we know are going to be in there. So this book is actually for our team members more than <laughs> No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm digging a hole fast. <laughs> uh, as Father McDonald, I, I was uh, baptized as a child and was brought up into the Catholic Church. And um, I, you know, I never felt for, like forced that I was, uh, you know, to be Catholic. I know if I was if I was to leave today, the Catholic Church, my my four brothers and my sister and my parents would probably come down, find me, and then beat me, you know, uh, you know, I got sense again, and then I would uh, say, okay, I'm Catholic again. But no, that, that wouldn't really happen. They, um, my parents just passed on uh, the Catholic faith and helped us, uh, all my siblings and I, to know uh, the beauty that uh, is within it. And, uh, you know, as I grew up in it, learning it, I grew to, to love it. And, um, you know, and that's what we hope your journey here uh, this year and the years to follow will be. But as you delve deeper into the mystery of, of the Catholic Church, you will have a deepening of your own faith and a deeper love for our Lord and will uh, gradually become uh, a better person and more... Uh, a great example uh, for others around you in following the way of discipleship that Jesus has called us to. So that, that's the prayer. I, you know, I, I was homeschooled, uh, so my parents weren't keeping us away from the world out of fear or anything like that. Actually, all of us children asked to be homeschooled. We said we were tired of the public schools, and it's a good thing because later on, my county that I grew up in lost its accreditation. So see, we were right. <laughs> you were right. We knew. But the truth be told, we wanted to be done with our school by noon, so that's the main reason. <laughs> but uh, so I was homeschooled, and that was a, a wonderful place within the home to cultivate the faith. 
And then later on, uh, throughout, uh, uh, after high school, I was working at the monastery in Conyers, Georgia. And uh, it was, that was a wonderful experience. I wasn't even thinking of becoming a monk or anything. But it was a, it was a quiet place for a lot of prayer and uh, discernment of what God might be calling me to. And uh, eventually, at the age of 21, I, I heard this call to be a priest. And that was just another step deeper into the mystery uh, of my faith and where he uh, was leading me. And, and it's been a joyous ride that's been going up and down through those years, uh, 12 years uh, since that initial call uh, to the priesthood. And, and uh, so unlike Father McDonald, he's had 40, uh, 30 years of priesthood, and out of those, he said, what, 30 years? You, you pretty much use the same book for RCIA. Well, every year that I've been a priest, four years, going into my fifth, we've had a different book, it seems like. So I'm, I'm going to be fine with the Catholicism for dummies, I think. But, uh, it, it, you know, my Catholic faith I love, I have a passion for. Growing up, my brothers and I would try to uh, convert all our friends. Most of them were Southern Baptists, but not all of them. Uh, in fact, uh, any girls that my brothers and I would date, we would try to, again, say, hey, you got to be Catholic in order to marry me, so come on, <laughs> be gone. And uh, that's, that's, that was just how we grew up. Uh, when we would when we would have friends over for the night, my mother would say, you know, we're not going to stop our family practice. So they will see us pray together at dinner. They will eat dinner with us. They'll see us pray in the evening, praying the devotional prayers like the rosary and reading scripture. And and a lot of my friends who are not Catholic say that was some of the most peaceful times in their childhood. That they loved to come to the Ferguson home and pray with us. And that was something I was embarrassed about. Uh, we never liked my mother when she was, uh, when we were growing up, when she would yell out in the, in the middle, in, in the evening at 7 o'clock, 7.30, my dad was done watching the news, and she would say, kids, it's time to pray the rosary, and all our Baptist friends go, see, we told you to worship Mary. I <laughs> said, no, no, it's not that. It's not that, Mom. Quiet, don't yell that out. You know, that's what we would, that's what we would say. But, but that, was, that was part of my growing up, and it just became part of, of the life that I lived. And so it was never a moment where I said, wow, I don't want this. Uh, but rather it was just saying, I want more of it. I, want to, I started craving to learn more, and, and I can't get enough of it even now. Uh, always, always learning uh, about, about my faith. So as Father Don said, as the team said, and I will say too, if you ever have any questions, you want to know further about it, you want to know a book that might be helpful to understand it, besides the books that are already being suggested, shoot me an email, give me a call, uh, or come by the office and hopefully I'll be there and we can uh, sit down and talk and, and uh, have a wonderful conversation about, our, about, about faith and about our, our discipleship in Jesus. And now I'm going to turn it over, I think lastly is... Bob? Uh, Jerry. Jerry. Jerry's watching. So Bob's not going to talk. He's just a comic relief as he said. So we're going to turn it back over to our, our leader, Jerry. When I find Buck up, I'll take a last Buck, would you like to come forward and say to you? Hey. We'd like to know your history. All right, well, then we'll be ready for this post. <laughs> Anything you want? Go for it. There are a lot of you. Uh, well, the only thing I can, I can think of immediately, am I the only charter team member of the RCIA here? Good gosh. So, well, I'm a charter member. That's amazing. Uh, one thing I did want to mention is that uh, when I got back to Macon, by the way, if y'all were wondering, I am not the former mayor of Macon. Uh, some of you may. Okay. Um, yes. So, uh, but when I got back to Macon from North Carolina in 2003, most people here I found did not know what the internet was. Uh, and they, most people discovered the internet around 2005, I think. So we actually do have a website for those of you who, who like to live online and who are mouse potatoes like me. Uh, it's rcia.cc, that's easy to remember, like Catholic Church. 
Uh, and it's not been much of a site, but now Lynn, our camera person here, is working on it. She's an incredibly good web designer. By the way, if you know about who needs some web design, she's quite good at it. Right? So, um, and, and is looking for work. So. But she is, she is quickly rebuilding our RCIA website. Uh, so we'll have, I think, the schedule, we'll have the, I'm assuming the videos will link to it and uh, all sorts of other stuff. So that's, uh, that's something that occurs to me to mention. <laughs> okay. Can I just put the mic down now? <laughs> Give you a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a cradle Catholic. Uh, I've been at St. Joseph's for 33 years. And uh, I think as long as you've been married. It's 30? 30? Okay. Uh, final life began in Washington, Missouri. And uh, as I went to grade school, high school, and Catholic college, straight on through, I ended up in the seminary for a couple of years. And uh, then I discerned that uh, that particular calling wasn't for me. So uh, I went on and I continued with college. And then uh, when I got out of college, I went ahead and got married. And I started working for Oh, I'm going to tell it all now. <coughs> Secrets Distillery. And then I went to work for Bailey Banks and Middles. And then I went to Brown and Williamson Tobacco. So I was trying all the vices. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, <coughs> as it ended up, uh, I worked for Brown and Williamson for 16 years and helped start the plant down here in Macon. And uh, then we had what they called a Black Friday. So I think that was the beginning of my return you know, stepping off from the seminary, having a flowing space where I was trying to find my way and the Lord was trying to teach me a few things. And when I got to Brown Williamson and had this Black Friday, it was two weeks before Christmas, and they said, sorry, Jerry, you don't have a job anymore. So I was totally devastated, uh, did not know what to think. On the way down to Brown and Williamson, a friend of mine had called me ahead of time before they called me, and uh, before the company called me. And uh, he said, be prepared, here's about what's coming. I prayed all the way down. And uh, before I got to the front gate, there was a peace that came over me. It was so quiet, so still, so comfortable. And when I walked, walked into the front, front office, somebody escorted me upstairs. <coughs> and I got, got to the plant manager's office. and. Uh, I uh, said, Jerry, sit down. And he started fumbling around <clears throat> three times before he told me what he wanted to do. He went to the washroom and washed his hands and came back out. And he sat down and he says, this is very difficult. And he said, you're, you're one of my best supervisors. And he says, uh, but I must tell you this. And uh, so he gave me the news. So I went home and uh, ended up telling my wife and did not know what I was going to do. Just a few weeks before uh, Christmas, our first little one was coming on. Uh, Lane was pregnant with her. But for some reason, that peace came over me, and everything was okay. And I think at that point, I went to a personal uh, relationship with my Lord. I mean, really personal. I started getting on my knees and praying. Uh, we had what we called the bottle room, because I dig antique bottles for fun. <clears throat> and uh, I would go in there and I would kneel down and I would pray. And I would, uh, I learned how to pray, I think, best in the, in the seminary. Just getting quiet and contemplating and meditating and praising God. And for some reason I had the heart to pray, to praise at that particular time. I think it's one of the most powerful prayers there is. But it's in that personal relationship with Him that I think I really made contact with Him, or He made contact with me. He started pulling me up and raising me up, giving me that extra confidence that I needed, drawing me in closer and closer to where I really got to know him and got to know who he was. And the fact that I was turned loose from Brown and Williamson, I had to start praying uh, because I could see something happen, happening to me there. It could have been any company, not just Brown and Williamson. But I saw myself drifting at times, being tempted with things I didn't need to be tempted with. 
And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I know I don't need to go here. You need to help me. And when I was in that room, then it started dawning on me. That's what he was trying to help me with. <clears throat> so not knowing what to do, and I didn't want to go. We just came down from Indiana, left all our friends, started developing friends down here, and we liked it down here, and we really wanted to stay. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I said, you just got to show me what to do. So you got to walk with me all the way. The same thing happened when I took this job for Father McDonald this summer. <laughs> I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, I said, you've got to help me all the way. Um, but anyhow, he, he did. And uh, I had a hobby of antiques. And uh, I started doing pottery restoration uh, on the side. Uh, there were a lot of bottle diggers who found both broken pottery, things like that. And before long, for some reason, he gave me the ability, the knack, to restore pottery. I developed my own processing. And uh, lo and behold, it was supporting the family. I started doing museum restoration. And then lo and behold, I talked to Mike Bryce, who owned the antiques for Bolingbroke, uh, and I bought the place from him uh, just five years later. And I'm now in the antiques business. But my relationship with him is awesome. I love the Lord. <clears throat> and uh, there are many, many stories along the way uh, that I could share with you. I'm going to share one, one more story, and I'm going to try to get through this, through this one. But anyhow, it's, uh, I think it's one of the major milestones, and it, it happened about seven years ago. And it uh, has to do with my, uh, my mother passing away. Hey, I was sitting at the Antiques of the Bowling Road, in the front room, looking out the side window toward the church that was next door to us, still is. And the steeple is real tall and runs up in the trees, and I was just looking, looking in the trees. And all of a sudden, People say this, I heard this voice. I thought, I know this voice. And it was mom. And she said, Jerry, I, says, I gotta go. She said, I love you. I said, I love you too. And Lane was standing at the, at the mantel because it was in December. She, she turns around, I'm sorry, it was in November. She, she turned around and she said, what did you say? I said, I loved you too, mom. I said, what's that about? I said, Mom, he just passed away. She said she had to go. Uh, so, anywho, I conversed with her, had a few tears, and I said, if you don't mind, I'm going to go out to the farm and, uh, and just walk around a bit, just ponder. So I left, I did get down the road about a mile, just under the 475 overpass, and my daughter called me, Mandy, who I'm very, very close to. She said, Dad, I just wanted to call you. She said, is there something wrong? I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I shared that with her. And then we were sitting there, and a local policeman came, came by. He's the kind of sheriff, actually, uh, Richard. And uh, I rolled my window down, and he stopped next to me. He says, uh, is everything OK? I said, no. And I told him. He said, you sit right there. I'm parking behind you. You can stay as long as you want. So we, we went ahead and talked for a few minutes. And uh, my daughter and I. And then I went ahead and headed out to the property. And before I got out to the property, which was about four miles, my brother calls me. And he says, Jerry? I said, yeah. He says, I've got some news for you. I said, I know. I said, you know what? I said, Mom just passed away. How did you know that? I said, well, I said, she said goodbye. <clears throat> so, and we had a conversation. I went on down into the property and into the woods. And uh, I got out. I walked a while. I came back out. And uh, as I was coming out, and I got in about the same place, which happened to be a graveyard that was uh, right next to the property, right next to the property. And my brother called me again. And he says, Jerry? I said, yeah, Dave. He says, uh, I've got something to share with you. I said, go for it. And uh, went ahead and pulled off the road. And he says, uh, he said, I'm here at the house. I said, okay. He said, I'm in the kitchen. He said, I'm looking up at the clock. I said, yeah, I know that clock. I said, it's right next to the air vent that goes outside, and that clock's been run since I was a kid. Because Dad and I put in the clock and the air vent at the same time, and he let me cut the big, long handle that went on so Mom could reach it to pull it open. He said, well, the Jerry says, that clock is stopped. 
I said, hell, I said, this is never stop. I said, I know. So I lived there all my life too. And uh, I said, uh, what time did it stop? He said, 10 minutes to 4. I said, oh, my God. He said, you ain't gonna believe this. I said, try me. He said, do you know what day it is? I said, yeah. I said, it's November 13th, 2003. He said, that's right, but do you know what day this is? And I said, oh, my God. <clears throat> November 13th, 1978. Ten minutes before my father passed away. Anyhow, the Lord touches you. You know, He touched me. And I think that's a, that's probably one of the very reasons I'm I'm here right now is that uh, I know Him and I want to share Him. You know, and uh, each one of us has something very special within us to share. Okay, I like to think of this world as a great big crystal ball that has. You know, the little mirrors all the way around it. You've seen it before, you know, and they're circling, you know, and dances and whatnot. And in that ball, it's a great big ball, and in that ball, everybody has got a window to look out. Okay? They can only see out the window. Nobody else can look out that window. So everybody sees something that somebody else hasn't seen. And they have an opportunity to share it. So each and every one of us has something that God has touched us with and shared with us to share with somebody else. And that's each and every day. And with all those windows, with all we have to share with, it continues. And we, <clears throat> as somebody said here a while ago, that uh, you never stop growing. You just keep learning and learning and learning. And it's from the people around us. And as I said in the little, little email, uh, don't be, be surprised if the, if the Lord touches you through someone else because He doesn't work alone. He often works through His people. And I think oftentimes that's why, it's actually how the Lord wanted to teach us family life with Him. You know, the, the saints who are here on earth, who walked the earth, and now are in heaven, they have a separated com company. They're still there. They still share with us. So there's that unity of heaven and earth. And we see that most preciously in the Mass when we worship and praise together. And this is something I'd like to share with you all. So, God bless you and I thank you for listening.